Open your Bibles to Esther chapter number 2. We're in the book of Esther as we uh, continue our study. And remember, our theme for this year is I Believe God. Would you say that with me, please? I Believe God. No matter what happens around us, no matter what our lives may look like today or tomorrow, we can still choose to believe God. We looked previous weeks at the book of Daniel and saw a man who followed the Lord in some very difficult times. And last week we turned our attention to Esther, a lady. Don't forget that God can use everyone. Man, woman, young, old. No matter your background, God can use you. If you would look in Esther chapter 2 this morning as we continue our look at, in the life of Esther and what was happening there, I've entitled this message, What in the World is Going On? Have you ever felt that way before? What in the world is going on? I can't help but look around and wonder what in the world is going on. We look out across our nation, what in the world is going on? We look across the world, we have a global pandemic, what in the world is going on? And as we look at Esther this morning, I see a time in her life where I believe she must have at least had this random thought, what in the world is going on? You see, sometimes when we read about a Bible character, we think that they're not really like us. They wouldn't have the same thoughts that we have, and there's some super Christian some super follower, and of course, God used these people, but they are flesh just like you and I. They're like us. They're like us. And I wonder this morning if, if maybe Esther had this same question, what in the world is going on? Look, please, in Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse number 8, where the Bible says, And so it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together under Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that, that Esther was brought also into the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification, with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her, out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids under the best place of the house of the women." Esther had not showed her people, nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus every, came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women of the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Shishagaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came into the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now in the turn of Esther... The daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go unto the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken to the king of Hazarias into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month to Beth in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he let the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, when Mordecai sat in the king's gate, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. In those days when Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth, and sought to lay hands on king Ahasuerus. And the, king was, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, 
Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have, these brief moments, or in a busy week, in a busy life. Lord, may we not miss the message that you have for us today. Lord, may you quiet our hearts. Would you help me, please, to communicate those truths from your word in a way that would be consistent with your character. Lord, would you touch us and change us today. Lord, if someone's here, either physically in the building or on the sound of my voice, and they don't know you as their Savior, Lord, would you touch their heart today? Would they hear your gospel, and would they trust you as your Savior today? We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. What in the world is going on? Now, this is a familiar story to many people. But you have to look at Esther chapter 2 and you say, okay, what, what, what is happening in the situation? What, what is going on? What is going on in Esther's mind? What is going on in, in Mordecai's mind? I'd like to ask you a question this morning. When things don't make sense, what do you do? When you don't understand the why, what is your reply? When things don't make sense, what do you do? Sometimes with God, when we don't understand why, we quit following God. We say, God, well, when I figure out what you're doing, then I'll follow you. When it makes sense in my mind, and don't forget what the Dalton saying this morning, God doesn't think like you or like me. And that's a wonderful blessing in both of our lives. Is it not? If he thought like me, you would be dead at times. If he thought like you, I'd be dead at times. God doesn't think like you and me. But we want to understand God. We want to understand what is happening and make sense out of the turmoil or the chaos or the problems. What is your response when you don't understand what is going on? The fact is, we take advantage of a lot of things that we don't understand. Many of you use a cellular device, a cell phone. And many of you have no idea how it works. Many of you don't know how to make it work, much less how it works. They take what? Silicon and some metal, and then I push some numbers, and I can see your face. It's like Star Trek all over again. Yet, you don't complain about that now, do you? Unless it doesn't do what you want it to do. I can't get this thing. And let me just have a side note in here for technology. If it doesn't do it, pushing it harder will not make it work. <laughs> All right? Pushing it harder will not make it work any better. But you don't understand how cell phones work. I know maybe some of it, but I don't understand all how it works. Yet we use them every day of our lives, some of us. Automobiles. I don't really understand automobiles. Now, some of you would laugh at me and say, well, Pastor, that's easy. But my mind doesn't work that way. I'm more of a computer guy. I use my car, though, every single day. We take advantage of many things that we don't understand. How about marriage? Many of you don't understand how that works either. <laughs> they take advantage of that as well. We take advantage of many things even when we don't understand. Yet when it comes to problems or spiritual things, we're tempted to say, well, if I don't get it, then I can't quite follow. I can't say I believe God unless I see what He is doing. And here we have a chapter in the Bible where God is doing some things that no doubt Esther does not see yet. She can't. If, if that's all we knew of Esther, and I read you that story, you've never heard it before, you would have no idea the end of the story. You would say, this doesn't make any sense at all. Mordecai here, a fourth generation captive, no idea what in the world is going on. If, why, if the why isn't answered... What will you do? If the why isn't answered, do you, will you cry? If the why isn't answered, will you still comply? If the why isn't answered, will you deny? If the why isn't answered, will you still glorify? What in the world is going on? And say this statement this morning, don't wait for the why to comply. Don't wait for the why to comply. We're going to look at some things this morning inside of this account, this story that I believe will be a help to us as we face uncertain times. Maybe because of news and because of situations, our minds are a little more in tune with the uncertainty, but the fact is, we are always in uncertain times. And we always serve a certain God. 
For who knows what a day shall bring forth? That is uncertain times. God is still on the throne. Though we're always in uncertain times, our God is always certain. I see, first of all, in this particular account, I see a problem. I see a problem. The problem I, first of all, see is I see a king's personnel problem. The king got rid of his queen, and he, now he needs a new queen. Apparently, a king cannot reign without a queen. At least that's what has a rarest thought. That's what he believed. So he has a personnel problem. He, I guess, woke up a few days later and realized, oh, I've got rid of Ashti, and now I have a situation. I better find a new queen. So they send out a large decree to every province and every tongue. They say, listen, we're going to find the prettiest women, and then we're going to choose the queen. He has a personnel problem. I wonder if in Shushan, which where the king lived, and Mordecai and Esther lived as well, I wonder what their thoughts was when they first heard about Vashti, the queen, being unqueened. At that point, it hadn't affected Esther yet. Maybe they heard about the decree, and remember he passed a decree that, 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 uh, that the, the women should follow in the different tongues or all the different languages. I wonder if they were sitting around the table, drinking a cup of coffee, saying, oh, did you hear the news? We no longer have a queen. Okay, life is normal except it was about to be life as unnormal. You see, one man's problem may be preservation for another. King Hazarius' problem over here seemingly would not affect anything else, but the fact was God was setting up the perfect plan. And though they could not see what God was doing yet, God was working for this end game over here. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. I can't help but think in our world today we see problems, floods, protests, diseases, to name the current ones. And it goes far deeper than that. We have problems all around us, marriages broken up, lives destroyed by addictions. We have problems all around us. The fact is that though we may not know what God is doing, God is still at work. Reminds you of a man by the name of Ron Hamilton, Patch the Pirate. If you've heard his testimony, he talks about how when he found out he had cancer in his eye, that he was not discouraged. God used that as an incredible opportunity. And many, many have grown up listening to the songs of Patch the Pirate. Little by little, inch by inch, obedience is the very best way. And many, many other songs, which I can probably sing almost all of them for you. If we had the time, I'd play the video of Pastor Dylan singing one with Patch the Pirates, but time forbids it this morning. If you got that news, would you have the same attitude? What in the world is going on? I wonder now if... Brother Ron Hamilton would trade his eye back instead of the cancer. I wonder if you could ask him, and if you did, I would imagine his response, no way, no way. If I knew then what I know now, Lord, you can have both my eyes for the ministry you'll give me. What in the world is going on? Our problem may be in God's perfect plan. I read this story during a particularly tough time. There was a young 13-year-old girl trying to comfort her mentor, this lady, in this tough time by saying, don't forget what you told us about Moses in the wilderness. Referring to how her mentor had told her about God's promise of his presence. To which came the reply, yes, my dear, but I am not Moses. But the young girl replied, yes, but God is still God. That's powerful right there. God is still God, and I choose to believe God. Our God is still powerful. Our God still reigns. Our problem may be in God's perfect plan. But the story takes another little turn here, and Esther gets put on a path. See, there's a big problem back over here with the Hazarius that doesn't seem to affect anyone or, or, or the people. Or, or why would it affect me? I'm minding my own business. But all of a sudden, Esther and her beauty is thrust into the limelight. All of a sudden, Esther is snatched away from her home, away from her surroundings yet again. Remember, she'd lost her parents and she'd moved in with Mordecai who had adopted her or, or took her in as, as his own daughter. 
And now she is pulled out of her situation again, her comfort, and now she's snatched away because she is too pretty for her own good. That's why she got snatched away. It wasn't her personality. They weren't looking for that. They were looking for the prettiest women. That's what they were doing. And, and they said, oh, Esther, that's a pretty one. We'll take you. And she's so pretty and does have such a sweet demeanor that she is put, the Bible tells us, to the, as the most favored of them all. They, they, love, they all love Esther, except probably other women who would be jealous of her. Esther's past, she was beautiful. And it was perfect for God's plan. You see, God equips us for His plan. Well, why do I have this? Because maybe God wants to use it over here. Why do I look like this? Why do I have this? Because God is setting something else up over here that you may have no idea about. You see, if Esther was a baby, she'd probably be the Gerber baby. Always a pretty girl. You see, we didn't choose our talents, our gifts, or abilities. We only choose if we will let God use them. Some of you are talented in ways that I will never be talented. You have different gifts and abilities than I have. Some of you can work with people in amazing ways. Some of you can communicate truth in a wonderful way. Some beautiful voices. Some are gifted with your hands. Some are gifted mentally. We all have talents, abilities, and gifts. And God wants to use all of them. You know, we get, we, we get silly. We, we waste our time doing this. We look at someone else's gifts and abilities and wish we had theirs. Well, if I could only sing like that person, then, then I would, I would be what? If I could only talk in front of people like that person, then I would, then do, what, 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 what would you do? You would instantly now start to serve God where you weren't serving God before? Is that what you would do? Well, if I only had that much money, then I'd give to God. We look at everything else, what someone else has, and we always pick the good things, don't we? We, we don't pick the, the hardships or mistakes, we just pick the blessings that we see. And Esther here had, had a, a gift. She was beautiful. But she did not get to choose her own path. If someone had asked Esther, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know that she would have said the queen. She didn't wake up that day and say, hey, here's my interview to be queen. She did not get to choose her path. It was chosen for her. Esther, you're coming with us. Esther, say goodbye to Mordecai because it's the last time you'll live in his house forever. How would you respond? Or can I ask it this way, a little more pointed? How do you respond when you don't get to choose your own path? See, in America, we like to be in control. As men, we like to be in control, our own destiny. When things are out of our control, do you still follow? Are you still faithful to God? Esther, her path was chosen for her. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely by his side with love and strength for new, each new day. He will make a way. You see, sometimes our path is not chosen, or our path is not our option. Sometimes our path is chosen by the Almighty. And I see Esther in, in this situation. She could have taken a detour and said, listen, life isn't fair. That's not fair. I don't want to be the queen. I want to be with Mordecai, my uncle. And hasn't my life been hard enough? And why do I always get knocked around? But I don't see her doing that, do you? I see her still being faithful. Some of us need a perspective change. How about this? A guy was crossing the street to visit his neighbor. As he started to cross the street, a car was bearing down on him, so he stopped and backed up to the curb. The car stopped, and so he started to cross, and the car started to move again. He changed direction, went back to the curb, and the car moved toward him, and then he moved to run across the street, and the car swerved in that direction. He moved left, the car moved left, he moved right, and the car moved right, and finally he stopped in the middle of the street. And the car stopped. And he looked in the car, and lo and behold, there was a squirrel driving the car. He said to the squirrel, what in the world is going on? And the squirrel replied, I wanted you to know how it feels.
perspective. Perspective. But sometimes we feel like we're that squirrel on the road and God's trying to hit us on every single turn. Can I catch a break? Our perspective needs to be changed. You see, what in the world is going on? God is at work. What in the world is going on? God is doing something. He's in the current. He's in the air. He's all around us, working after the counsel of His own will. In your life and in my life, God is at work. Those that love God, He's working all things together for good. But God is at work no matter what. No, don't miss this. God is at work everywhere around us. God is in control. Nothing happens without God. I see a problem, but then I see a pattern. I see two areas that I would like us to be challenged with today as we look at our life and sometimes when we have that question, what in the world is going on? I want to challenge us this morning in the first way that Esther showed us something. She showed us something in a pattern. She showed us un challenge compliance if you look at two verses in chapter 2 if you would please in verse number 10 where the Bible says of chapter 2 Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it see Esther was a Jew Jews were taken captive uh, about four generations earlier Daniel was one of the first uh, people led away in captivity and uh, 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 Mordecai's great-grandfather, I believe his name was Kish, uh, was also taken captive in verse number 5 of chapter 2. They'd now been in this strange land in Persia for a number of years. And the Jews were not well-liked because they were in captivity. We know that later on that's a springboard for Haman, the villain. We'll meet him next week. So Mordecai had told Esther, don't show or don't reveal your background. Don't reveal that you're a Jew. No, I'm not exactly sure why Mordecai gave her this instruction. The Bible doesn't tell us why. I, I don't believe that she would have been killed, but the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. But he had given her that instruction, all right, and she was in his house, and, and he said to her, do not show who, who you are, you're a Jew. You just go and do the best you can. And the Bible tells us that she followed that, verse number 10. But I, as I was studying, I found something that I'd never seen before. Look at verse number 20, where the Bible repeats itself but adds another phrase. Esther had not yet showed her kindred, nor her people, as, Esther, as Mordecai had charged her. We read that in verse 10, right? But then catch the end of verse 20. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Well, look at that. Isn't that amazing? The Bible kind of slips that in there. It reminds us that Esther had followed the instruction of Mordecai, but then as almost a side note, said, by the way, what she was doing was the same thing that she had been doing, which was compliance, which was just following, which was just being faithful, just doing what she was supposed to be doing. Who knew that when maybe she picked up her clothes when she was real young, that that would save her life later on. She was just doing what she was supposed to be doing. Don't ever underestimate consistency for God. My life's not doing that. I'm just going to church and reading my Bible and praying. Well, there's glory in doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's not boredom. It could be the foundation for God to use it, the springboard, the diving board, the platform, for God to use it later on. The Bible slipped it in, but I think it's a tremendous and a powerful truth. Esther had established a pattern of submission and obedience in her life. And that pattern brought her freedom and brought the preservation of the entire lot of Jews later on in the story. Because she was doing this over here. God used it over here. Listen, Christian, listen, my friend. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Doing what you're supposed to be doing. Whatever God has called you to, then do it with all your might. He's called you to go to work, then go to work every day. He's called us to be a witness, then you witness. 
to give and to give, to teach, to preach, to, to, to share, to, to serve Him. You see, what could be viewed as restrictive was actually the key to freedom. I wonder what kind of household Esther and Mordecai were in. I wonder if they're one of the households that maybe young children we think we're in sometimes. I can't do nothing. My parents don't let me do anything. Said about every teenager at least once in their life, right? That thought. Oh, my parents are so restrictive. Young children, oh, bedtime. Oh, who likes bedtime? Parents like bedtime. That's who likes bedtime. All right, who likes nap time? I do Sunday afternoons. Understand that, that those things that we view as restrictive are the keys to freedom. I read a silly account of a man in New Zealand by the name of Ivan who was fighting what he viewed as a silly rule and that was the seatbelt rule. He was ticketed, the story or the, the news article goes, 32 times for failing to use his seatbelt. And even though this was costing him big money, he still refused to buckle up. Finally, because of all the fines, he decided to rely on deception. He fashioned himself a fake seatbelt that would go across his shoulder and then back behind him across and then around his weight with an extra long strap. His trick worked for a while, the news article informed me, until he had a head-on collision. You obviously know where this account's going to go. Head-on collision, he was thrown in the steering wheel, and subsequently he perished. Discussing the accident, the coroner described the fake seat belt. Although his car was fitted with seat belts, an extra long strap had been knotted above the seat belt on the driver's side, providing a belt to simply sit over the driver's shoulder. He viewed it as restrictive. And ultimately, his view cost him his life. If he had followed the, the path, if he had followed the, the rule that was in place, he would most likely still be alive today. You see, Esther, in this situation, the Bible tells us, yes, she followed Mordecai, but it wasn't the first time she'd followed Mordecai. She'd done that her whole life. And my friend, the first thought I have for you today in this world of what in the world's going on, stay faithful. Keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. Keep on spending time with God every single day. Seek His face in His, wor in His Word. Pray. Let Him speak to you. This Bible is not just a prop. This Bible is the very Word of God. It'll change your life. It'll revolutionize your way of thinking. It'll revitalize your marriage. It'll help your work. It'll help your finances. It'll help every part of your life. Keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. Thank you for your faithfulness here and many of us online as well. Keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. But pastor, what in the world is going on? I just don't get it. I just don't know the why. Will you still comply? You see, I see an unchallenged compliance. And then I see unrewarded good deeds. The last three verses of chapter 2 give us just a small little almost footnote about Mordecai. Almost in a, in a small note, it, it almost slipped in with almost no relevance. Esther has become queen, has, has dominated almost the entire chapter. And for three verses, Mordecai hears about an account of someone trying to kill King Ahasuerus. He tells Esther, Esther tells the king, they tell it in Mordecai's name, end of story. Except later on, God is going to use that, that little three verse side note to really tweak the villain. To really just set this whole thing up in motion. Now that's the end of that, but what I, what I noticed, what I want to bring to attention this morning is there was unrewarded good deeds. Nothing happened for Mordecai when he did this. He did right to a pagan king, a captive king. 
Someone that he could have said, well, I don't owe him anything. He, he took my land captive. He took my great-grandfather captive. I don't owe him anything. But that's not what he did. He did right. He did right, and then he doesn't even get a thank you card. He doesn't even get a pat on the back. He doesn't get a phone call. He doesn't get a call before the king. It's like it never happened. What do you do when you're faithful and you do right and it seems like no one notices? You know what some people do? They quit. They quit. Or they post it on social media. Look what I did. Look at me. Not Mordecai. You see, in a strange land, Mordecai still respected the king. In spite of no reward, Mordecai still remained faithful. He'd recorded a pattern of service in his life. You say, what is God doing? He's working all things at the counsel of his own will. What in the world is going on? Well, God's about to do a great work. So if I can help you this morning, Christian, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Let God do this. Mordecai could have, he could have jumped off the ship at this point. Esther could have said, that's it, I don't want my path. But they didn't. They didn't. They remained consistent. They let God work. God can use faithful people. God will use faithful people. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You don't know what's going on? Don't quit. Does it make sense to you? You don't know the why? Well, still comply. Because God's doing something bigger than you can think. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your grace and strength. Lord, I thank you for Esther, more K.I., but really, Lord, the truth from your word. Lord, help us in uncertain times, Lord, around us in our lives. Lord, we're tempted to throw in the towel. We're tempted to just say, forget this. But Lord, I'd ask you to use us. Lord, help us to be faithful. 